This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Good morning, good morning. Ain't it a great morning outside? I mean, it is beautiful. Here it is, uh, middle of May, almost. Well, this is the middle of May, and we're going to be talking about gardening. A lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff has come and gone. A lot of stuff is just beginning, but there's all sorts of things people are wondering about. Good stuff, bad stuff, weird stuff, stuff you heard about, maybe you're not sure about. That's what we're going to talk about for the next hour. You've tuned in to the Gestalt Gardener. It's a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting, and I'm your host, Horticulturist Felder Rushing. Uh, Abram is uh, kicking us off this morning, uh, and we're going to be having a great time for the next hour. Java's on his way, and uh, again, it's a it's a it's a program about gardening. So if you've got some things you want to talk about, and I've got some too, including some surprising stuff. Horticulture's fell to rushing, and we're going to be talking about gardening with the next hour. And uh, we got two screens in here working, so I think if I squint, I can see one of them. So if you want to give us a call, it should pop right up and tell me who you are and where you're from, and we'll talk about whatever's going on in your garden. A lot of things going on right now, a whole lot of things, because the weather is so nice. We got some um, big holidays this weekend, of course, <clears throat> and uh, we're just going to talk about gardening. A lot of things going on in my garden right now, things are starting to fade. The, the English peas are starting to peter out a little bit, eating a lot of them, but uh, you know, when it gets hot, they sort of start slowing down. My lettuce has gotten bitter. You know, I'm not saying that because I'm bitter. But the fact is, it's a pretty plant. I grow a lot of different kinds of lettuces in containers and pots and mix them with, with a parsley and a, and a monkey grass and all sorts of things, some green sticks. And, you know, basically I just mix things up like a flower arrangement. But with the lettuce, I've got frilly stuff and flat stuff and uh, g- bright green stuff, dark green. I've got some that are deep, deep, dark burgundy and some that kind of uh, speckle with red. And I put them in a pot and they're pretty to look at. When I'm tired of looking at them, I can eat them. And that's what we do. So um, a lot of, but, but now it's time to start replacing them with stuff for summertime, like like peppers and basil, so many different kinds of basils. And again, you don't have to call yourself a vegetable gardener. You don't have to say you've got a herb garden. If you just grow these things because they're pretty, that works too. A lot of people forget that Vegetables aren't called vegetables because they have anything in common. They're called vegetables because we eat them. Uh, Herbs aren't called herbs unless you use it as a herb. It's just a plant. You know, if you don't rub it on your arm, it's not going to repel mosquitoes from your yard. So um, anyway, if you've got some things you'd like to yak about, uh, I know lawn care is coming up. People are starting to see a shift in the type of plants growing in their in their lawns from the winter slash spring uh, wildflowers to summer stuff. And uh, there's some terrific native plants blooming, fantastic plants that happen to be good garden plants, too. We're going to be talking about that. So I can't read that little sign out there, but there's something that says, starts with a C. Uh, this is like an, an eye exam. Can you see that? No. I believe uh, it's Corin. Cor- Corin. Or that would be Corrine. Corrine. Corrine from Oxford. Hey, Corrine, how are you this morning? How are you? I'm fine. Is it Corrine or Corin? It's Corrine. Corrine. <laughs> Yeah. So sorry, we tried. <laughs> That's okay. That's What's, okay. I'm used to it. What's up this morning? Well, I was wondering, does compost go bad or sour like spoil? Oh. Um, I've got a I've got a container with compost in it that um I haven't been able to to tend to because I've been ill. Um and I was just wondering, can I still use it in my plants or does it? Yeah, yeah. Compost is just totally decomposed, totally degraded organic matter, whether it's from plants or animals or, or, or whatever, just totally degraded stuff. Uh, the only way it can really go bad, you know, after a couple of three or four years, it can just turn into dust. Or if it gets wet, it can stink, you know, sort of like having dirt between my toes. It's just not a – you can grow tomatoes in it, but between your toes is not a good thing. So anyway, it won't go bad if you use it reasonably soon. 
So, uh, okay. you know, but I, you know, and you don't have to save. You can just dump it behind your shrubs if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. No, smell it. S- smell it. Oh. <laughs> Let's see what it smells like and then take it from there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Corinne. Okay. okay. Oh, no, no. But it's not, not Corinne. What is it? Corinne. Okay. okay. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, let's slide down down to Natchez and talk to Francis. Good morning, Francis. How are you? Good morning, Felda. Thanks for having me on. I called you about a couple of weeks ago, and I told you that I started my plants for my garden and cups inside. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got 16-ounce styrofoam cups, and I you know, put holes in the bottom so that it could drain. And it's been too muddy for me to uh, do my garden. Uh, you know, to till it and make the rolls and everything. Uh-huh. And uh, my cucumbers, yeah, cucumbers are starting to bloom. Is this a lost cause? No, no, it's not. But when are you going to get around to putting them out in the yard? It's so muddy. It's been raining every day. Well, at least set set the pots and stuff out where they get some real, you know, they need real sunshine. That's, the, you know, that's their, that, that's that's the energy that runs us. Like, you know, uh, okay. you're, you're, you're gas, you know, you're below not just below quarter, you're below the empty mark, and you can see a service station through the window. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you just make it out that window, you'll be fine. Okay. Whenever it dries up, it'll be okay to... Uh, well, put, you put them in the ground then, but right now, they, you know, they're still living, breathing, and suffering. Okay. They need some help. They need some sunshine. Help. Yeah, they got help. Uh, they're on my front porch now. Yeah, well, at least, you know, give them a little water. And once they start blooming, you might want to hit them with a little half-strength shot of some liquid fertilizer. Because that potting soil has got zero nutrients, and water and air have only got three of the 17 things they need. So, you know, maybe a half-strength shot, you know, whatever it says, putting a gallon of water, put that in two gallons of water and uh, and just hit them with it real light. That'll perk them up. All right. Thank you, fellas. All right, Francis. Appreciate it. All right. I uh, stole some flowers on the way in. Uh, Abram, you don't know about this, but I steal stuff. Yeah, Liz was telling me about that. <laughs> she said you just pick up anything that you find along the way. Oh, no, no. I drive out of my way to get some of it. Really? Yeah, that's right. But uh, one of my neighbors got this plant, and I know you can see it. It looks like a big uh, big bouquet. I'm going to say that's probably three inches across. looks like a purple or lavender <sighs> There's not another flower like it. It's, yeah, I wish we had some video right now because those are very pretty. Well, it's a it's a plant that grows in ditches in Mississippi. It looks like a fat leaf monkey grass. Monkey grass grows in clumps. People roll, you know, they line their flower beds with it, and it's got it grows like that, and it's got a uh, little bit wider leaves, but the flowers on it are won't fit into a coffee cup. And they're lavender, and it's a plant that's it's in the aster family, and it's named after the guy who who named it. His name was Stokes, so they call it Stokesia. A lot of people say Stokesia. Well, Stokesia or Stokes aster is a fantastic garden plant that happens to be native to the ditch banks of Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas, Tennessee. It grows in low wet areas, but it grows fantastic as a small clumpy type of plant with huge, huge flowers this time of year. And uh, we're going to be talking about that tomorrow in Jackson at the Natural Science Museum, which is right off of Interstate 55 and Lakeland Drive. Native Plant Society is having this annual meet, and I'm giving a talk tomorrow afternoon on how to get away with using these kind of plants, how to choose ones that don't look wild, they don't look weedy, they don't look you know, meadowy. They look like just garden plants, just regular garden plants. How to choose them and which ones do really, really well without any care. They happen to attract pollinators and and they have all sorts of benefits, uh, includes diversity, attracts native uh, insects, but also they're just downright pretty and they don't look like wildflowers. Well, they're not wildflowers. You put them in your yard, they're not wild. They're cultivated native plants. And we're also going to be talking about accessorizing and stumperies and a little, creating little vignettes in your garden that happen to be native plants with all their wonderful benefits. But anyway, uh, I believe that Stokesia is definitely the Mississippi coming out on that 
pronunciation right there. Yeah, yeah. It's just like saying monkey grass. Everybody says, is it Liriope or is it Liriope? Well, Liriope sounds really country. You know, I mean, I'm not going to be judgmental, but you're from North Mississippi. That's they Y'all say Liriope up there. Oh, yeah. You well, know? if we're not saying monkey grass, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, But here's the funny thing. That's Latin name. Uh, Liriope, Liriope. It's really supposed to be Liriope because it's named after a, 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 a Greek nymph named Liriope. But as long as we call it monkey grass, everybody knows what we're talking about. <laughs> so anyway, let's slide down to the Gulf Coast to Biloxi. Larry, good morning, sir. Uh, yes, this is Marvin. Okay, very good. I want to talk to you about uh, tomato plants. Yeah. My tomato plants for the last four years, uh, it gets to be producing about an inch, inch and a half tomatoes. And then one by one, the plants start wilting and dying. Yeah. Is there anything you recommend? Well, a couple of things. First of all, I have a book written in the 1930s that is titled Diseases of Tomato, a whole book on diseases of tomatoes. So they're they're susceptible to stuff. And there's quite a few that can cause what we call tomato wilt. You know, the whole plant just collapses all at once, like through boiling water on it, or sometimes a branch at a time. Uh, but they're almost always root or lower stem diseases. Not much we can do to prevent those, except try not to plant tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year, because the problems build up. So moving the tomatoes around helps. And there are some varieties that are resistant to those diseases. They've got weird n- n- letters after the name, like you may have heard of a VFN hybrid. It'll be on the label. Those are resistant to those things. And other than that, it's just a matter of tr- hoping that it doesn't rain so much because a lot of plants, a healthy plant, can, a lot of times a healthy plant can, uh, can, can tolerate these problems. Uh, but if they stay really, really wet or they stay really dry, it causes root damage, and the, the disease gets into the roots that way. Anyway, other than watching your watering, not keeping them too wet, and try not to plant them in the same spot every year, maybe choosing some disease-resistant res- varieties, about the only thing we can uh, do otherwise would be grow them in containers. You know, a five-gallon bucket with some soil in it is going to be relatively sterile as far as diseases go. So sometimes you have a lot of problems with it, need to switch over to growing them containers. But there's, there's yeah. not a treatment for it, is what I'm saying. Yeah, the plants, they grow so beautiful. And, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, one by one, start uh, yeah. yeah, you know, that that happens to us, too, after a while. But, you know, best you can do is take care of yourself as best you can. The same thing with the tomatoes. You know, try not to, yeah. you know. And also, if you push them, a lot of times people don't understand that fertilizer uh, is good. It's like food is good, but too much causes problems. And so I always recommend people fertilize it less than the recommended strength to keep plants lean and mean. So other than yeah. light yeah. fertilizing, not water too much, not much else you can do. So that book that you mentioned is Disease of Tomatoes? Diseases of Tomatoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, is, this is a scientific publication written back in the 1930s. But anyway, what, what I'm saying is there's a lot of inf- If you want to know more about these kind of things, the most common ones, uh, Mississippi State has got a website called MSU Cares. St- stands for like Coordinated Access to Research or something like that. Anyway, MSUcares.com. And then in the search box, just, just write tomato diseases. And boom, you got a whole okay. little publication with pictures and everything. Okay. Now, here's the here's good news, Larry. You have until August the 7th to plant tomatoes on the coast and still get a crop before fall. So don't give up. Don't 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 okay. think like a farmer. Just one thing. You know, you can replant in July or August. A lot of times they don't have the problems that we have in the hot, humid, rainy yeah. springtime. By the way, I think you miss Larry. 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 But anyway. Okay. Who who is this? Yeah, this is Marvin. Marvin. <laughs> Wait, are you are you on the coast, Marvin? No, no. I am in Hattiesburg. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, this is a case of an old guy with bifo- new bifocals, and I'm trying oh, to get a job. I have to throw my head way back to see what's in front of him. Anyway, good luck on it, Marvin. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you bet. I think that was just a little phone glitch. I'm sorry about that, Mr. Marvin. That's okay. That's okay. You're learning well, young man. <laughs> do, do we have Larry from Biloxi? Yes, we do. Larry, how are you this morning? Sounds like I've got a little switchboard problem going on. Huh? That's that's okay. I've got I've got old chubby fingers. 
Uh, and bifocals. Anyway, what you got going on this morning? The Parkinson, middle of the Soto National Forest, and I, I from Biloxi and lived there my whole life. And um, I brought my plants with me, and I have a pink flamingo that um, doesn't seem to be doing too well up here. It's got spots all over its leaves, and I thought, well, maybe I'm drowning it. So I've repotted it and put a little more topsoil in it, so it's not such that. Moist potting soil, so it have a little drainage, but um, I just can't seem to revive it. Any? Uh, well, any well, f- well. First of all, the, I'm sure there's a lot of plants named pink flamingo. The only ones I'm familiar with is a type of celosia. It's got long, skinny flowers that are kind of pink and white at the top. So, w- what do you call them, pink flamingo? What was? What is it? Well, it it's, uh, it it comes like if you were to take a chandelier and turn it upside down, but it's all pink. And it, it's not pink and white. Uh, a friend of mine um, uh, went to the plant sale at Bellingrass Gardens and, yeah. and, and brought it for me. And I've never seen one. I heard one before, um, you know, and, and it did beautifully in Biloxi. And I'm just up here, and I just I just can't seem to seem, seem to get it going and stay that way. It, it looks droopy, so I give it water. Then it's in the spot. And so I repot it, and it's like I'm, I'm not winning this game here. <laughs> well, here's a couple of things. Uh, and and while we're doing this, I'm, I'm, I'm Googling pink flamingo because I'm curious about what it could be. Um, here we go, pink flamingo plant. Uh, oh, I see what it is. I see what this is a tropical plant. <laughs> it's a semi-tropical plant. It's a, it's a, a, a shrub that's got big old I mean, really fluffy, almost like like mum looking flowers. Almost, yeah. Yeah, um, it doesn't want to stay wet. And here's the problem: if you plant, if you overwater plant, and it stays overwatered, it gets root damage. And uh, they can grow new roots, but meanwhile, the top part says, "What are you guys up to?" And there's nothing there to be up to. So sometimes overwatering causes a a lag problem. Sometimes it may be two or three weeks before you see the problem. And, of course, the first thing you do want to do with a plant that's looking bad is you water it, which can overwhelm already root, uh, damaged roots. Um, here's what I do. And keep in mind, I'm a horticulturist. I'm curious. I, I don't mind killing a plant trying to figure out what's killing it. If you'll poke around with it, maybe even gently repot it, pull it out. If it's got pretty good roots, go ahead and put it back in the soil and don't water it too much. If the roots are... You know, just not many roots there at all. They're not healthy and white. If they're not, if they're kind of mushy brown looking, put it in a smaller pot. Maybe cut the plant back because that'll take the immediate pressure off the plant. You know, right now it's sucking on roots that are struggling. So if you cut it back, that gives it the roots a break and they can put out new growth. So in other words, examine it. Take it out of the pot. If it's wet, nasty, stinky, not you know, firm and all that, go in and repot it in a smaller pot, cut it back, and let's see if you can't revive it. But it's not any, now, kind, of tr- not any I, kind of treatment. If I cut it back, does it have to have a leaf on that on that stem in order to continue to grow? No, it shouldn't. Yeah, but as long as, as long as the stem is sturdy, you know, cut it above where some leaves were and the little side shoots should sprout back out. It's sort of like cutting a rose. You know, you can cut a shrub back to where it doesn't have leaves on it and it'll sprout back out. This plant will do the same thing. Okay, I'll I'll keep you abreast of the uh, progression. Okay, now you know these are educated guesses here. Uh, that, that's better than the one I had. <laughs> okay, all righty, man. Well, good. Let, let me know how it is. And uh, hey, if you get a picture, if you can, uh, shoot me a picture of it because there's I'm just going through a pink flamingo. There must be fifty plants called pink flamingo. The first thing I came up with it looks like a big old pink mum. Um, it's it's not as it's not as full as a mum. It's it's more of a teardrop, but the mum like yes, it can. Okay, I, well, I think I may have one when it was in bloom, and uh, I'll email it up to you. Do that. That way we can get a little, little bit more accurate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All righty. Um, by the way, I brought in not just the Stokes Aster, Stokesia, Stokesia, whatever you want to call it. Beautiful, beautiful, terrific garden plant. It grows like a daylily. grows like monkey, somewhere across between monkey grass and daylily is how it grows. Big, beautiful lavender. And there's some white ones and some deep blue ones, Stokes Aster. But I also brought uh, some pieces off of my Mississippi native bottle tree.
My Mississippi native bottle tree is a bottle tree that's, that's covered with bottles that were filled with stuff in Mississippi. Mississippi bottle tree. There you go. See, I'm talking to, to the Native Plant Society, Mark. So we got a native bottle tree now. Horticulture's fellow rushing me and Abram Nanny, our, our, our I, I'm not going to say guest uh, uh, boss, but what what do you call yourself? When you say, I work for MPB, what do you tell people you do here, Abram? Um, mostly engineering, but uh, we're calling it a rookie right now. A rookie. <laughs> rookie. Okay, well, we're going to be uh, having a little bit of fun talking about gardening for the rest of the hour. and got some callers on the line, but l- let me first mention that this Felder of Field this weekend and next weekend. I'm on the road again uh, this Saturday, tomorrow. I'm going to be giving a talk at the spring meeting of the Mississippi Native Plant Society, Saturday, May the 13th. It's going to be at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science in Jackson. And by the way, there's no charge for this uh, except for ent- uh, the admission to the museum, which I think like six or seven bucks, something like that. Incredible museum, the, the Natural Science Museum, uh, right at the, the intersection of Interstate 55 and Lakeland Drive uh, in Jackson, Highway 25. Uh, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. They're going to have plants. They're going to have a plant swap. They're going to have native plant sales. they got lectures starting at, at 10 o'clock. And if you've got something else planned for the whole day, uh, come on in the, in the afternoon. 2 o'clock, I'm giving a talk on how to get away with native plants and other accessories without honking off your neighbors. And that's the title of it. Uh, and also, a week from, to, from this weekend, on uh, next week, at the plants, uh, th- th- we're going to have a plant swap in Greenwood. Actually, just outside Greenwood. Uh, Charlotte Gilmer has invited me up. We're gonna, her home is hosted all sorts of garden clubs been featuring a bunch of, of magazines, Mississippi Gardener, DeSoto Magazine, uh, Farm Week, all sorts of stuff. And it's in just southeast of Greenwood. And we'll give details about that uh, n- next week. But anyway, Plant Swap on Sunday uh, week from, t- from this weekend. Now, let's talk to Larry, who's been hanging on for Wilkinson County for a long time. Larry, thank you this morning. What's up? Good morning. I love y'all's uh, show. Appreciate and you the, being part of work, it. And the work that you're doing. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. What what you got going on? Well, I got containers on the ground in the yard here, raised garden, and I have a problem with ants getting up in there. Yep, me too. <laughs> I, I I have I have a stumpery. A lot of people don't even know what a stumpery is. You know, there, some people have rock gardens. They pile up rocks and put a bunch of desert plants. I pile a bunch of stumps and logs and things like that and put ferns and shade plants around it. And there's a fire ant mound up uh, at least three and a half feet off the ground in a stump. But that's just what they do. They're just looking for high ground. So anyway, here's a problem. We don't have a lot of insecticides that are safe to use own vegetables. You can use them near vegetables and around vegetables. You can treat the mounds that way, but uh, a lot of the traditional stuff you put on mounds can poison vegetables. So you got to be got to make sure you read the label. Uh, there's all sorts of repellents that people use: citrus oil, uh, you know, uh, almost anything like that. Except about the only thing that won't work is grits. Fire ants don't eat grits, uh, <laughs> but there are some insecticides you can use to treat the mound. Uh, without putting it all over the whole garden. If you treat them out late in the day when all the ants are in the mound, then um, by morning they'll be gone, and so will the insecticide. Anyway, go to the garden center, look for something that says you can use it around vegetables. Almost any of those things will kill fire ants if you're thorough. You just want to make sure you don't hurt your vegetables or you in the process. Right. Well, I don't have anything in it, in the container, and I, that last year it happened the same thing, and I took and uh, put that uh, ant poison in there. Yeah. And then uh, later, sometime in the year, I just took and dumped it all out and spread it out in the yard there. Yeah. Yeah. But I was just wondering if there was some way I could raise it or what could I do to put around it, you know, to keep them from getting up in there. Well, what I do on on my deck, I have what they call pot feet. You know, uh, they have these little little ceramic things you can set maybe three of them up under a pot that gets it up off the deck about an inch it keeps it from staining uh concrete or or causing a, a rot in the deck it just gets them up off the ground you could do that with crushed up beer cans or something like that but i don't know if you got a whole bunch of them out in the yard i i'm not gonna send you out hot as it is i'm not gonna send you out lifting up pots sticking stuff up under it 
So the best thing to do is just right. deal, de- deal with them as they appear and live with those you can. I'm, li- I'm just living with the ones in my garden, and I know where they are. They don't bother me. I don't bother them. And uh, they sort of... They, they sort of keep other fire ant mounds from popping up. They, they spread this time of year because of the rain and the, you know, the, 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 the colonies are swarming. They're splitting up. Uh, so they'll settle down pretty soon. If you can learn to live with some of them, that might help. I'm just sitting there scratching my elbow just thinking about it. But anyway, <laughs> main, main thing, if you decide to treat them with something, make sure it says safe for vegetables. All right. Thank you. Okay, Larry. Good luck on it. All right, and let's slide back to Clinton. Danny, I appreciate you holding for a while, man. What's going on? Yes, sir. I've had an ongoing battle with nematodes for 30 years. Oh, boy. you probably, Would you bring some I, river sand into your garden one time or something? I, I don't know. But uh, I asked uh, county agents and everything. I'm originally from Macomb. Yeah. And I was down there, and nobody knew anything about it. So I just went on my own, like you said, went to pots. Yeah. And didn't know what I was fighting because they're microscopic. Yeah. And uh, the roots just swell up. And, and, and beautiful knots. plants. But the roots are all knotty looking. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of nematodes. There's a lot of different nematodes, and some are actually beneficial. But the ones that root knot nematode and a couple of others, they feed on plant roots. Here's the deal, though. Usually, you're not gonna have them in containers, and unless you introduce them, you know, you, when people bring river sand or something to their garden, a lot of times they introduce it that way. There's not any real good way to kill them. That's a one-shot thing. It takes a while. You know, you could you could take you could 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 uh, work your garden up. Spread some in the summertime. Spread some clear plastic over it and weigh the edges down, and the sun will sh- shine through just like in a a truck with the windows rolled up. And it can, it, but it, the sun doesn't kill it. The water turns to steam, and that can do it. It's called solarizing, but it takes a long time, and it's in, and and it really only works if you do it June, July when it's really really hot, and that's just a real pain. There's a material out there that's made from ground up. Uh, seashell, uh, uh, oyster, not oyster, shrimp shells, whatever you call the, you know, the stuff we peel off of shrimps. Uh, it's called clandosan. Clandosan is made from ground up shrimp shells, and it does a pretty good job. But nothing's going to completely get rid of them, Danny. Nothing. Well, I, f- I found something that does a lot is marigolds. What you don't. You know, they you, don't like marigolds, and they'll go away. You know, Dan, you are exactly right, and I'm so glad you mentioned that. People plant marigolds in the garden say, marigolds cure this, marigolds do Marigolds don't do anything in the garden other than being pretty and smell like dirty socks. The only thing that they do is if you grow them and then till them into your soil, the, then that, that takes care of a lot of nematodes. You have to work them into your dirt, though, for them to really work well. Otherwise, they just dig right. a few inches over. But marigolds tilled into the ground do help control. They they don't control. They uh, what's the word? They uh, I can't Repel. think of. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, anyway, they they basically they keep the populations down. Here's one last thing, Danny. If you'll keep your plants pretty good dirt, if you keep them lightly fertilized and watered, they can out they can outrun the damage. A lot of plants can live with nematodes as long as you keep them healthy and actively growing. So, you know, that's another thing. Mine just fell over like I poured scalding water on them. Yep, yep. Well, anyway, that's <laughs> about it. it. Cucumbers and tomatoes. Yep, man. yep. That's about it. That's about all we can do. There are nematode-resistant varieties of tomatoes and peppers and green beans. They have an N behind their name. N means re- resistant to nematodes. But that's about it, man. That's about it. But I moved. Uh, just a minute. I moved. From Macomb to Clinton, Mississippi. Yeah. And my, my next door neighbor, Bill, he's a horticulturist. And I talked to him about the nematodes, and he said they're not nematodes up here. Well, he's wrong. Uh, actually, they I, don't, they I, don't I, like I, soil. It, he it, said. Is this the Bill that used to work down at the Crystal Springs Experiment Station? Uh, I don't know. Well, if you had tell him, he tell him, fellas, he's wrong. I've, I, I was the extension horticulture agent here. 
for 20-something years. And, yeah, we got nematodes here. They're not native. They're usually brought in with river sand or something. Anyway, don't I ain't going to get in a, into a, a, a contest <laughs> with him. But uh, if you do have nematodes, forget what Bill says. What can we do about it? You know, marigolds help the next year. Solarizing helps. Yeah. Using resident varieties, clandestine, and uh, keep your plants healthy. And that's about it. Growing in pots. That's not- I thank you, Felder. Okay, Have a great then. Day. All right, stay stay cool. It's hot and humid out there. Uh, oh yeah, just get out there, cut your sleeves off, and get out. There you go. Well, we're going to get back to talking about gardening. I've calmed down a little bit. I got real excited, and uh, and I'm looking forward to giving a talk tomorrow afternoon, Saturday, at the Museum of Natural Science in Jackson to the Native Plant Society and the general public. Everybody's welcome. This is for people who don't understand that native plants are just plants that have to be from here. We're going to look at great plants that work well in the garden. You know, magnolia is a native plant. Of course it works in the garden. But there's a lot of really, really cool plants that are garden used all over the world except in our yard. How to get away with them, how to choose them, how to use them in a way that that, uh, that looks good to you. Create little vignettes and also uh, without honking off the neighbors. A lot of accessories and stuff. Anyway, let's go back to the phone. Let's go up to Memphis. Uh, Mari has been hanging on a long time. Good morning, Mari. How are you? I'm fine. Good. How are you doing? Fine. Thank you for holding. What's up, man? My grandfather was a great watermelon farmer. He raised and sold watermelons over around the Aston, Mississippi area. He got you. Uh, and, and I've been trying to raise watermelons, and I'm, I'm, I'm not doing good at it. I, I grow some pretty plants, but uh, fruit don't. Yeah. Are you doing this in a, like in a field like your granddad did, or are you doing them in your yard or what? I've tried to uh, well, uh, have a little raised bed. Yeah. Okay, uh, a c- couple of things. First, first of all, you know, they, they grow good in just good dirt, D-I-R-T, dirt. They don't need a whole bunch of soil preparation, okay? So if you got really bad dirt, you need to add a little stuff to fluff it up, sort of like adding crackers to a bowl of chili. But if you over-enrich the soil, if you grow them in uh, like a potting mix, that's not what they're adapted to. They're big plants. They've got big leaves. They've got long vines, and they need a sturdier root system. So you might want to just try digging down a little bit deeper and bringing some of the dirt beneath your raised beds up and mix it with stuff so it's part dirt and part other stuff. Uh, also, they need a good deep soaking but not kept wet. You know, watermelons are from a dry part of Africa. They do well with with long extended dry spells. So don't overwater and don't over fertilize. You know, these plants grow in what I just call pretty good dirt. Too much fertilizer, too much water, too rich of soil. And they're going to throw their flowers off. Now, here's the other thing. The melons, as they grow, they, they need to grow steadily. And so if we have a heavy rains or extreme drought, that makes them, the plants fluctuate and they don't grow as well. So other than, you know, not overdoing things, not trying too hard, uh, you know, and good deep soaking every couple of weeks or so, that's about all it really takes. Assuming you got good, you know, bees to pollinate the flowers and all that stuff, but... Really, the biggest problem growing melons and of any kind, cantaloupes, watermelons, things like that, is uh, people with raised beds tend to treat them like, like uh, tomatoes or peppers, and they're just a lot tougher than that. So it sounds like they should be raised in a separate plot from uh, tomatoes and peppers, because I'm growing them uh, in the same uh, plot as my tomatoes and peppers. It sounds like that may not be a good idea. Well, the thing, you know, plant them at one end or the other and just don't fertilize and, and water them as much. You know, even in a raised bed, you can have hot spots, you know, that you water, fertilize it more often. So, you know, just uh, and they're a good ground cover. So uh, I would just separate them, you know, a couple of feet or so away from plants that need coddling. And um, and and that should be enough. Just try not to push them too much. Okay. I'll give that a try. Uh, one, other, one other thing, more. look for varieties. You know, go online, go to some of the heirloom sites, and look for varieties that make smaller ones, you know, what we call icebox melons. Uh, a lot of times they grow better in these kind of conditions, those great big like Charleston gray that your granddad grew. So, you know, some of the variety, there's some that are more compact that are better suited for raised beds, not going to take over your yard. So try that, D- different varieties also. Got it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Okay, good luck on it. Appreciate your call, man. Okay, we got Mike and Chris. Who do we go to? Come on, boss, talk to me. I think Mike has been waiting for a little bit. <laughs> okay, Hernando. Mike, how are you today? Good morning, sir. 
Morning, Felder. <clears throat> Question, please. Yeah. Uh, what are these? And tell me if they grow all year long. Alongside the freeways and the roadways are these huge, looks like carpets of little dark red flowers. And I'm trying to figure out what they are. They're gorgeous. They're real, real dark, you know, r- red. Are they and like almost knee high? No, no, no. They're dinky, little bitty dudes, but they just looks like a carpet of them alongside the roads and between the freeway lanes and stuff like that. They're beautiful little dudes, and I'm wondering what they are. Now, are they red or are they purple? You said uh, they may be purple, but they look very, very dark, kind of a brick color, dark brick, uh, maroon huh. red. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm a I'm a weed watcher. I've watched stuff along the roadside, and uh, I mean, and if it's Me pretty, too. you know, and and I've been up and down the road so much, but I'm drawing a blank here. You know, the crimson clover is really, really dark uh, maroon, dark red, but it'll get you know uh-huh. a foot tall or so, and it just oh, yeah. waves no, no. and waves. Right, these are right down on the ground. They're just it looks like a carpet. And they're, they're gorgeous. And I get, I wonder if they're just native up here to northern Mississippi, but they sure are pretty. Okay. I'm going to make two educated guesses here. Uh, one is, nah, neither one of them work. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, we had, we had this thing, this Mexican primrose where they got pale pink flowers. And also there's a yeah. very, there's a brilliant, some people call it Argentine or, ver, or Brazilian verbena that just grows in uh-huh. thick, thick masses. But it's a brilliant electric lavender purple. So I don't know. I'm curious. I don't either. Well, yeah, I'm going to take a picture of it and send it to you. Hey, do, do that because if it lo- if it grows along the roadside in those kind of conditions and it's pretty, I need it in my yard because I've got those kind oh, of conditions. Too. So anyway, let's That's find out. What I, wanna, I want to put it between my plants. I thought that'd be gorgeous, you know. Well, somebody's going to call up middle, in a minute and say, Fella, you idiot, you, and say, here's what it is. You know, <laughs> if I only had a brain. <laughs> but yeah, it, I anyway, know. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I, I can't guess beyond that. But I want to find out. Okay, and I'll, get, I'll send you a shot. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, thanks. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. You know, it's nothing like having degrees on top of degrees and being retired from the university and blah, 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 to get stumped. What is that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Abram, welcome to the world of being able to say, I don't know. Yeah, that's something I'm going to have to learn at some point. Yeah. Well, Until you, then. Yeah, some, somebody says, well, fellow, you know that. Look, I know what I know, which defines what I don't know. If it's not in my memory bank, I don't know. And I'll be glad to look it up. But anyway, let's slide over to Hamilton, Alabama. Let's slide up into the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Chris, how are you this morning? I'm doing all right. How are you this morning? Good, good, good. So, well, I've been getting stumped a lot, but I'm okay with that. (laughs) Well, my first question kind of goes off the question earlier about the fire ant. Uh Uh-huh. But mine aren't in a raised bed. Mine are in my compost pile. Yeah. And I don't really want to move the ants into my raised beds. So is there any way I could treat them within the compost before I start moving it out? No. 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 Okay. And uh, here, here's the deal. Uh, I, I I have them in in my compost too, and uh, I mean in making my fingers, it's just thinking about it. If you go out and just stir the compost, the problem is if you treat them with something, that's going to kill your worms and all this other good stuff. And the truth is, they're really not hurting anything. They're just a threat to you, and they're irritating and all like that. So if you can live with them, that helps. Otherwise, if you throw, you know, if you wet the compost pile down. And then throw some clear plastic over it. The sun will shine through and heat up the, the moisture, and they'll run them out. They can't take that, that hot steam. And that, that does help. Okay. But if it's not really, really hot, they're going to say, this is nice, and they're going to just build a bigger mound up higher, close to the plastic. So anyway, not a good, not a really good solution. Okay. I just, right. work, I just um, work around them. All right. My other question is about native plants. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been trying to collect seeds on the ones I find on the roadside, but yeah. a lot of times I run into problems where they get mowed down before they're able to finish the yeah. seeds are able to mature and stuff yeah. like that. Right. So how uh, I guess feasible is it to move, dig them up and move them? Uh, well, a lot of people do that. I've done it myself, and it usually doesn't work. 
it works enough to give people confidence to to keep going. And a lot of people have an uh, uh, inability to avoid to to control their urge to stop and dig stuff up. But in general, this is just real in general, if a flower's blooming, it's at its weakest stage of growth. And if you dig up, let's say, a Queen Anne's lace or a Black Eyed Susan or this purple verbena while it's in bloom, it'll wilt before you get back to the car. So if you've got to do that, if that's your choice, cut the plant back, move the roots. You know, if it's a perennial, that'll work. Uh, if it's something that goes to seed, look around. Uh, I bet along the the, the uh, fence row, there's going to be some that the mower's missed. You know, okay. and and if it's if it's that pretty, then it's going to be fairly common. It's going to be fairly easy to find seeds someplace for it. So, uh, anyway, if it, it but digging a wildflower while it's in full bloom is what most people do. It's the number one killer of wildflowers out there. Digging it while it's in bloom. Okay. If it hasn't bloomed yet, could I cut the top and move it then? Depends on the plant. You know, if it's something that okay. uh, a lot of our wildflowers are blooming right now, there's perennial ones out there, you know, like the like like this verbena and, and all. Uh, but a lot of them, the seed sprout in the fall, they grow over the wintertime, they grow in the late winter, spring, they flower the set seed, and they die. So a lot of the roadside wildflowers, when they're blooming, they're already starting to die. See, so, uh, you know, it just depends on the plant. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rushing. Okay. Good luck on it, Chris. Appreciate your call. Yeah, I got stumped on that at all. I am giving a talk about this tomorrow, though. I've been working with native. I give you an idea how long I've been working with native plant. I was one of the charter, me- one of the original members of the Native Plant Society, twice past president. And I've lectured at the Native, the Wildlife Research Center in Texas, uh, all this kind of stuff. My yard, though, is not a native plant garden. I have native plants in it. It's not a herb garden. I grow culinary herbs. It's not a pollinator gardener, but I have bees and, and butterflies. I grow plants because I like them. They work for me. They, they make me happy. I can eat them. I enjoy what they do. I, the, the beauty, the year-round, the pollinators. I enjoy those kind of things, but I'm not growing them because they're native. I'm growing them because they're good plants, and there's a lot that are not that good. Here's what I can do for, for y'all, though. If you can't make it to the Native Plant Society meeting at the N- Museum of Natural Science in Jackson on Saturday, my talk starts at 2. It's free. You just got to pay to get into this incredible museum. Bring your kids. Uh, if you can't make that, shoot me an email. I put together a little brochure on native plants and wildflowers for Mississippi landscapes and gardens. It's a free publication. You shoot me an email, I'll send it right back. Well, it might take me over the weekend to get to a bunch of them. But uh, it's a uh, free publication. It covers wildflower meadows. It crosses good native vines and perennials and trees and shrubs and how to accessorize. It pretty well covers the whole thing. I put it together uh, to help me uh, stay organized. If you want a copy of that, send me an email. And here's how you do it. Go to felderrushing.blog. Not dot net, not dot com, but felderrushing dot blog. Scroll down about an inch, and it says email me, and just click on that and say wildflowers or something like that, and I'll send you this brochure. It's free, and it's something I put together a long time, and uh, be glad to share what I've learned with other people. So, uh, if there's any kind of uh, uh, and and by the way, my talk tomorrow, Native Plant Society, it's going to be fun. I got them to put the title as using these plants without honking off your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Abram, a lot of people don't want a bunch of wildflowers and weeds and stuff in their neighborhood. Yeah. So, uh, I think they're beautiful regardless, but I it, know a lot of people are bothered by them. Yeah. If you use them as regular plants, nobody will know that they're wildflowers. Right. <laughs> you know, and there's a whole there's a whole bunch of just astounding ones, just astounding. Uh, but again, I'm a vet, an advocate of growing vegetables in with flowers, flowers in with vegetables, trees and shrubs and flowers and, and uh, perennials and bulbs all mixed together. In other words, gardening, mixing stuff up, shapes and sizes and textures and seasons. And uh, there just happens to be a lot of really, really cool plants that are used more in English gardens and at the Floriade in Amsterdam. Everywhere I go around the world, I see these incredible displays of plants that happen to be weeds in Mississippi. 
They just don't use them that way. Anyway, uh, if you've got some questions during the week, you want to shoot me an email, go to felderrushing.blog and uh, click that thing that says email me. And if you have some questions you'd like uh, to to share with other people, don't want to go on the air, send me an email. We'd be glad to do that. So meanwhile, it's a good weekend to get out. If you haven't fertilized your grass yet and you don't want to, if you haven't in the past three or four years, you ought to. Lawns are not magic carpets. They're living, breathing creatures. If you raise your mower up, use a good quality lawn food, not triple 13 or an ag fertilizer. or gar- Use a good quality lawn food. And if it's too expensive, make the bag go twice as far as it says it'll go. That'll help your grass without killing your lawnmower. A uh, little bit of fertilizer, raise your mower, and then just sort of mow what grows. That works a whole lot. Uh, plenty of time to plant okra. Tomatoes, pepper, squash, all sorts of basils. If you got kids, or if you just live in an apartment, you don't have a lot of room, get you a big five gallon bucket. Go to Home Depot or Walmart or someplace, get you a big bucket, punch some holes around the sides, fill it with some potting soil, and grow a combination of basil and oregano and, and a rosemary, and put you a marigold or a zinnia or something in there. Have a pot full of bouquet that when you're tired of looking at it, you can eat it. So uh, this bottle tree I'm making right now, it's got Barks, bottled on the coast. It's got Southern Pecan, bottled in the kiln. it got Coca-Cola, originally bottled in Vicksburg, Mississippi. It's got Milk of Magnesia. All of these, by the way, there's a plant in Pascagoula, Mississippi, that was that bottles Phillips Milk of Magnesia. And uh, Abram, this is a plant that keeps a million and a half people a day working. <laughs> Anyway, we're going to have a, a, a Mississippi native bottle tree in my yard by the end of the day. I'm Horticulture's Fellow Rushing, uh, me and Abram and, and uh, all the other folks at MPB. Thank you for tuning in. We got programs following this one. We got them all during the week. If you have some things you want to yak about, MPB is a place to come. Meanwhile, take a kid to a garden center, go to a farmer's market, and show everybody that you know how to do what we do best, and that's get dirty. See y'all next week. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app 